when when there's a podcast to check out, when there's a you know videos to watch, it's usually Dan Rubenstein that is the face de- delivering it, and there's That's all it's nice. always being done with an Oregon Ducks slant in a way, even if it's subtle. So right. now you're stuck out on, on the East Coast. What's yes. going to happen come September? I'm so terrified. I'm so scared. <laughs> um, I know Ducks in New York. Uh, I know that there's an Oregon bar. I'm not a huge person on going to a bar to watch a game. I've always been able to watch in L.A. with uh, a couple friends of mine. West Coast Kevin, of course, if you listen to the Solid Verbal, he's a huge duck guy. And I always just, I, I get too nervous and angry and yell things like kill him on like <laughs> random second quarter kickoff returns that I shouldn't be. And being in a bar, it sort of takes that away. I love watching games with like really good duck fans. I also get really annoyed at like terrible bro duck fans. So... <laughs> It's just easier for me to be like a shut-in and watch these games alone. But now that I'm like I live alone in New York, I'll probably have to go to the duck bar. Or I'll probably have to figure out how to get ducks in my apartment. Um, but yeah, I'm terrified of like those 10:30 kickoffs because it's hard enough watching games from 9 a.m. to 7:30 before the duck games start. Mm-hmm. But now I'm gonna have to watch all of college game day from like 10 a.m. to noon, which I think that my math works out. And then Big Ten games don't start till noon. It's just, it's going to throw me, I'm like, I'm not even thinking about it yet, but I'm dreading, I don't know what to do with myself uh, at, at a 10-15 game. It sounds absurd. Well, when September comes around and there's a night home game for the Hawaii Warriors. That's Lily- just a morning game. That's the, that's a Sunday morning <laughs> game. <laughs> that's like a, it's like a World Cup or like a French Open or Australian Open game. Is right. Basically- French Open match. Set, set the alarm clock for 4 a.m. to wake up and somehow watch the TV for two hours and really go back to sleep. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm just going to pretend Hawaii doesn't exist. Even if Hawaii goes 11-0, and I'm never going to talk about them on the show. <laughs> never going to acknowledge their existence. So that, it's going to be my like contiguous 48 bias. Um, that 1 o'clock, that 12.30, I mean, there's not generally not the best games at like 12.30. Like, they're interesting games. If you turn to NBC and you turn on Notre Dame, you're guaranteed like a good 70 minute nap on your couch. That'll just completely recharge you from the morning games throughout the day. You get to the second half of all of the afternoon games and night games and you're just golden. And I don't have that anymore. My timing's all off. Unless you're a massive fan of red zone turnovers. If you if you get off on red zone turnovers, that's, true. that's the highlight of your day. That's true, but you can fall asleep at any point in a Notre Dame game and wake up to more red zone turnovers. So it worked out. <laughs> what are your expectations for both the spring game and going into the fall for the University of Oregon in that, you know, there, you always have to temper things when you're replacing a quarterback. But right. the rest of the roster looks stacked and the schedule looks phenomenal for the Ducks to possibly go BCS berth once more. I'm expecting a more defined role for DeAnthony Thomas, which should be interesting. Um... I'm expecting the playbook to be scaled back a little bit, but I feel like Brian Bennett should have a pretty good command. I'm assuming Brian Bennett, it sort of, it seems that we'll, we'll sort of shuffle into that role. A lot of people are sort of tantalized by the athleticism and the arm of Marcus Mariota, but it seems like Nate Costa notwithstanding, because he had 17 knee surgeries, um, it seems like generally the person most comfortable in that offense and most familiar with, you know, the mesh point with the zone read and just making the those quick decisions is the person that gets the nod from Chip Kelly. So I, I'm on the, under the working assumption Brian Bennett will be that guy. I assume there will be a lot more uh, running from the quarterback position, which will be nice. And not that I'm, you know, saying that Darren Thomas made bad reads or something like that, but I think the offense will be more dynamic. With Brian Bennett, eventually, I don't know how quickly that will be. Mm-hmm. Um, really excited to see the contributions of the redshirt freshman receivers. Really excited to see how the redshirt freshman offensive linemen are worked into the rotation and how they're worked in, where they're worked in, um, and probably most excited for the defensive line moving forward to to see the depth that they have coming back with Deion Jordan on the outside and then the the giant poly guys on the inside, Big Rick and um, Wade Kale- Kale'i Kipi, mm-hmm. and then mixing in sort of Jared Ebert and Reming- is, is Remington back? Yep. Remington is I, back. I think you missed a couple eyes in Wade Kale- Kale'i Kipi's okay. name, though. E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-
But that defensive line is going to be really interesting to me. I really like the fact that they don't have an LSU early on in the schedule to, to sort of set them back before the Pac-12 season. So they should have a good, um, you know, I don't know, rotation and good rhythm going into the Pac-12 season. Not, I'm, I'm really excited that they were able to work in a lot of the guys on the secondary last season. They lose Eddie Pleasant, but... If you're going to lose anybody in the secondary, I, I think Eddie Pleasant was the guy that you can do without, especially with how well they've recruited right. the second these past few years. So, yeah, I, I'm very excited for defensive line, very excited for wide receiver and quarterback. Um, schedule isn't daunting. I, I miss the fact that I won't be able to go to the USC game this season, I don't yeah. think. I'm going to try to make it to Eugene for a game. But, yeah, there, there's a lot to be excited about. I love, I love a team that... I mean, I love the fact that Oregon, you have questions about how are they going to use all of this young talent. Right. That's that's a terrific place to be as a college football fan. So of the guys who maybe redshirted last year or are incoming freshmen, are there any particular guys, just based on what you've heard, based on what what you've seen, uh, how closely you may follow recruiting? You know, everyone gets so caught up in the stars and until they actually get on the field, you never really know. But what guys are you looking forward to being able to see for the first time? I'm excited to see Devin Blackman, who I want to say was an Mm -hmm. All-American high school receiver. It'll be interesting to see how they work to Koi Sumler with his sort of raw speed in. I'm most excited considering the the sort of backfield questions where it seems like it'll be a rotation between uh, Kenyon Barner, D'Anthony Thomas, and the incoming Byron Marshall. Um, I'm most excited to see how, I want to say there's three redshirt freshmen that are going to be rotating into the offensive line and John Stone's Yoretta Goina. Is that right? Yoretta Goina. I, I call him Andre, you're the governor, but it, you're the it's, governor. It, it's uh, something like that. You're a toy gay Goyenia, I believe is how yes. you say it. Um, and I think James Escher, who I think is relatively local. Mm-hmm. Um, those three guys, if they have like a crazy good offensive line rotation, I know Jake Fisher played last year, either uh, at the tackle position, but losing Darian Williams is big. But if they are able to rotate in those three guys, I don't know if I'm missing somebody, and, and really are able to have a great second unit offensively, that's what I'm, you know, people talk about the concern with the wide receiver position, and I think they're going to be okay. It's, it's you know, they, they lose Jeff Mail two years ago, and they, <laughs> they win the Rose Bowl. So mm-hmm. I, I'm not all that worried as long as they can block, as long as they're incorporated into the offense in a way that makes sense with Josh Huff and actually somebody coming in who didn't redshirt but recruiting wise I'm really interested to see how they use Braylon Addison yes. who seems sort of like a jack of all trades who might sort of step into that taser role that DeAnthony played last season uh, especially with the backfield questions so if he's able to pick up the playbook relatively quickly that's somebody I think that could be a, a sort of an early household name absolutely Braylon Addison I've had circled ever since he came in in that he looks physically to me just like Chris Harper, right? Uh, and he has the same the same fundamentals, the same skills. He played a multitude of positions in high school. He can yep. step in. Everyone's so worried about running back depth after Trey Carson transferred out. I would not be the least bit surprised if Braylon Addison is one of the first guys that gets a look at right. a running back once they get. He's one of those guys you just bring in and you just you plug and play because he can play right. safety. He can play linebacker. He played quarterback in high school, wide receiver, right. running. Just put him on the field because he's so talented. He'll find a way to make a play. It's it's one of the, he's one of those guys that whenever you read about SEC players, like Morris Claiborne, for instance, one of those guys who was like the best player in his county. So they just lined him up at quarterback because they just had to have the ball in his hands. Right. Uh, a good friend of mine is a, a scout reporter for Scout.com, Annabelle Stefan. And she, I mean, she watched seven thousand of these kids, and uh, she in both the Southern California area, and then she did some work in Texas. And she said, "Oh yeah, Braylon Addison's the best player I saw all fall." I'm like, "Oh, okay." No, she's like, "No, he's just like unstoppable." I'm like, "All right, that makes sense. I'm excited for him." So that that from from that level, he's he's very excitable, and our guy's very exciting to have aboard and, and figure out how he's gonna. And he came in late in the in the recruiting process with. Chance Allen, does that sound right? So, uh, very excited to see what Braylon Addison is able to do, especially after sort of being swayed at the end. Absolutely. Well, are you going to get a chance to watch the spring game? Yes, I will. Please, <laughs> I will be watching. I think it's on ESPN three, so mm-hmm. I can stream it out here. Um, are you yeah. cheering for the green team or the white team? 
I don't know who's on either team. I don't know. Are they wearing crazy military uniforms this year? I'm sure they will be, yes. Yeah. Um, no, I'm very excited. Even though it seems like I remember two years ago, they just lined up. It was either two years ago or last year where they just started lining up in the eye. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what are they doing? And I got a, I got a note from Rob Mosley, um, the, the Oregon beat writer for the Register Guard, who's just like, oh, Chip Kelly's just screwing with people. Yeah. They're not funny. this. He's just screwing with people. He's screwing with you. He's screwing with me. He's screwing with everybody watching the screen, spring game. And then, of course, we watched the season. And they I don't know if they were ever under center. So I don't even know how to describe Chip. And I talk to you know current players and former players. And, and I, I try to ask, because you know, we, we hear through the interviews that Mosley and, and others do with him to kind of get a sense of his personality. And we certainly know the guy's a winner through and through. I think his, right. his career record is 34 and 6 at this point, which is yep. just beyond ridiculous. He's a, the only coach that's taken a, a team to three consecutive BCS games in, in the last mm -hmm. three years. And... His technique, his style, his whole approach, his persona, I can't associate him with any other coach. That's, maybe Mike Leach would be the closest comparison. As, yeah, but Leach, as a character that's just so out there and so different. Yeah, Leach was like quirky. and But yeah, one of the things I've heard about Chip Kelly is he, he likes to sort of find information about life and winning and success from all sorts of venues. There was like the long New York Times feature on the Oregon program where it talks about how he like obsessively reads business books. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was, I mean, that's, it's inter interesting stuff, but yeah, it's, it's weird that we don't have a huge sense of his, of who he is at this point and it, it, that we don't have a huge sense of personality be, besides like no nonsense and also like really dry humor. But yeah, it, it's a, it's a unique situation to Oregon and you know, one of the things that I love listening to was Urban Meyer when he was at ESPN talking about how, like, I don't get any of what he's doing, but he's doing exactly what he wants to do, and it's working. Right. And it's it's incredible to watch, um, like, it, it, from day one almost, when Chip Kelly came in, it was like he was taking notes as he was an offensive coordinator, like, this is what I would do if I were in charge. And he came in and immediately, you know, changed practice times, changed how practices worked, you know, added the music, and added all this, like... It was, it was as if he was always prepared. And if you watch this Oregon team, it's very much a reflection of Chip Kelly's personality, Chip Kelly's mantra. And I don't, it, it's a weird thing to remember, but uh, the, the time I really realized what kind of coach he was was in that overtime game against Arizona in Tucson a couple of years ago. I was at that game, yeah. When, you know, when the Arizona fans jumped onto the field thinking that it was over. Um, when they ran the last, I think it was the last drive of the game and then their overtime drives, when they looked like they just had such a plan and had been going over that drive for five months. Right. And Arizona was, you know, he, he'd call a draw play on third and nine or fourth and nine or whatever it was to the Michael James and he ran for 15 yards. And how Oregon was so confident in what they were doing and so well versed. And then when, you know, when. Uh, Jeremiah Masoli is rolling out and hitting Ed Dixon for an over-the-shoulder pass or hitting Jeff Mayle in the end zone or running the zone read on the goal line. It was like, there's not a doubt that this is what they're going to do. And he just so thoroughly outclassed Mike Stoops. It was it was like a, a like a, a genuine moment for me. I'm like, this is awesome! It It's not often I hear the word class and Mike Stoops in the same sentence. That's, right. that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dan, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, everyone who's watching, please do go to solidverbal.com, listen to Solid Verbal, go to youtube.com and type in SB Nation to check out all the videos that Dan's doing. It's fantastic stuff. You've wasted a lot of hours uh, for, for me at work. when, you know, Like, like, so you, like you said at, at DreamWorks, you've wasted a whole lot of productivity for me, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that. That's amazing to hear. That's our goal. <laughs> Fantastic. Our goal. Less work accomplished for the same paycheck. All right. Absolutely. Well, That's why we're here. Well, since you're on the East Coast, it's probably nearing your bedtime, so I should let, 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 let you go. But, Dan, thank you for joining us. As always, go Ducks. And uh, we'll be watching for what's next for Solid Verbal and SB Nation. So. Uh course any anything anything for you k triple e triple r triple t one as yeah. legendary as they come thank you very much man and thank you for joining us for the fish duck 101 video podcast dan rubenstein as always go ducks go ducks <laughs>